Hi guys and welcome to my latest batch of mini reviews where I basically review seven films in the time that it would normally take me to review just one. Since I last did one of these videos a few weeks ago I have been barreling my way through seven more movies and I am now ready to share my opinions on those movies. I'm going to take these in the exact order in which I watch them. There's no order bias and I don't really think any further words need be said in terms of an intro. So let's jump into it and we will start with this film. This is a horror anthology film featuring 10 stories, believe it or not, and I actually took a punt on buying this on Blu-ray because I spotted this double pack on eBay that includes Halloween Haunt and Tales of Halloween. Now, Haunt, or, or Halloween Haunt, depending on what region you're in, one of the best slasher films of the last 10 years for me. So even if Tales of Halloween had turned out to be awful, I still would have been happy with this purchase. But to my delight, Tales of Halloween turned out to be excellent as well. I was a bit worried that with there being 10 stories, there wouldn't be enough time to get into each story before they ended. I mean, when you've got a more conventional anthology of four or five stories, even then it feels like the directors, writers, that they're really having to rush to sort of tell their story in the limited time they have. But somehow they made these even shorter stories of like presumably 10 minutes each to fit into a 90 minute, 100 minute runtime. There's no poor stories on this. There's nothing that I saw that made me think, oh God, that's just garbage filler. Let's get to the next one. At worst, there was the occasional mediocre one. And in some cases, these stories were actually excellent. They left me craving even longer versions of the stories. Not that I'll ever get them. There's no wraparound story to speak of, but I think that's a good thing when, you, when you've already got the challenge of fitting 10 stories into a movie. There's this little radio segment thing with Adrian Barbo doing a very, very brief voiceover, but other than the fact that it gives us a chance to find out Adrian Barbo is still alive and making movies, that was of no real consequence. It's got a very light, playful tone, this film. A lot of the stories made me think of Creepshow, but I, I could never really get into Creepshow. I know it's a famous horror anthology, but... I much preferred this, and I think this is the sort of thing that you could literally put on on Halloween, get the family watching it. If, you, if you've got kids sort of between 11 and 17, then I think you could all get round, watch this on Halloween, eat some chocolate and have a good time, as long as the kids aren't too young. So I'm going to give this four out of five. It's, it's already, I think, probably one of my favourite horror anthologies that I've ever seen. This is the worst film on today's video, and yet it's not completely terrible. Normally when I do these mini-reviews videos, there are always at least one or two films that are just complete turkeys. Not today. I think I've been quite lucky with this stretch of films. So this is as bad as it gets today, and yet it's not a film completely without merits. So storyline-wise, it's about three YouTubers who do travel videos. And for their latest episode, they're going to Morocco. But when they get there, they stay at this motel that's like run by this dodgy landlady who's in league with the devil and she's protecting some kind of demon. I'm a little bit vague on the details because it was a couple of weeks ago I watched it now and by the time that the action, the proper action, really starts to kick off in this I was already a little bit kind of bored and flustered and I was like, you know, come on, can we just get on with this? It's You're past the point where I'm going to consider this to be an excellent movie. Some of it is found footage and some of it isn't, which is just really jarring. Like we'll follow the action through somebody's camcorder for like five minutes and then it'll just turn itself into a more conventional movie and then it'll go back to the camcorder thing. I, I really didn't like that. The characters are not up to much. I, I did like the Morocco setting. Not only does it look good, but you get that feel of Americans being completely out of their element in some distant part of the world. That came across really well. And the ending's quite good. I mean... The ending of any movie is the hardest part to pull off for me, and this film does it with gusto, given the fact that the rest of the movie is, is completely so-so. So by the time I got to the credits, I was sort of thinking to myself, I'm, I'm going to have to bump up the score for, for this a little bit just because of that ending. That was actually quite good. So I'm going to give it two out of five. I mean, I, I think I saw it on Amazon Prime, maybe. So based on what I've said, take it or leave it. But personally, I say leave it. This is a slasher film which is available on Netflix. Now, here's the thing with me and Netflix. I actually decided to get rid of it a few weeks ago. I thought to myself, uh, £16 now for the family plan. Do I really need that in my life when, as, as a family unit, we've already got Amazon Prime, Disney, and I've got Shudder. 
Netflix is easily the most expensive of all of those. So remind me again why I'm paying for it. So I actually went through the whole rigmarole of clicking cancel and getting it all sorted out. But then I realized that it would still be another two weeks before the service was actually cut off because I'd paid up front sort of thing. So I decided for those final two weeks to watch a whole bunch of horror films on Netflix that I'd not previously seen just to get my money's worth sort of thing. The trouble is, all those films I watched in that little two-week stretch turned out to be really, really good. So at the end of all this, I thought to myself, I can't get rid of it now. The content being produced is clearly too good. I mean, they're going to have to keep producing it in order for me to not cancel again in the future. But for now, I'm going to click on that renew button again and, and keep my subscription going. So essentially, this is one of the films that helped save Netflix in my household this month. It is a fairly derivative slasher, but it does have quite a few nice creative things about it. I thought it takes place in one of those really small rural towns that, it, it, if you think Smallville from the Superman movies, you, you're basically there. It's got cornfields and there's no city for like 100 miles. A lot of the teenage characters like to sit around in cars expressing how they've got to get out. I mean, they've just got to get out of this town. They can't say why. They've just got to get out, you know. I don't know why, because this town looks really nice. It's got that really idyllic, peaceful sort of thing about it. There's apple trees and stuff and cornfields. It looks absolutely gorgeous to live in. But for some reason, the teenagers have all got to get out as if their lives are suddenly be going to become really good once they start living in a really expensive, polluted city. It must be a young person's thing, but I, I, I just can't understand why teenagers in a lot of these movies have just got to get out. And in this film, they won't get out anyway, a lot of them, because there's this killer going around killing people who have done bad things. So the first victim was a school bully. The second victim, it turns out, was doing these really fascist YouTube videos in secret or something. We don't find out how all these murders are connected or who the killer is until right at the end. So this film does feel like a bit of a scream knockoff, but in a good way, because it's it, it's a pretty good film, actually. It's like somebody is literally a fan of the Scream movies and thought, I want to do my own version of that and set it in, in a place like Smallville. So if you've got Netflix, for me, it's an absolute no brainer that you give this one a watch. I'm going to give it three and a half out of five. I'm going to embarrass myself a little bit now, but I've probably done that so many times over the past 300 and odd videos. What, what difference does once more make? So a while ago, I was going through the George Romero dead films, and I realized that there's quite a few of them actually I don't own. And then I spotted this triple pack on eBay. So there's a bit of a theme today, isn't there, of, of multi-pack horror films, and, and this is another one. This just happened to have all the Romero dead films that I didn't own. It was it was a match made in heaven for me. It, it's got Survival of the Dead on this, Day of the Dead and Diary of the Dead, basically three of the six movies. So I bought it, but then it, I, I realised that not all was as it seemed because the Day of the Dead on here is not the actual Romero Day of the Dead. It's like a remake from 2006 or something. So basically what they've done is they've come up with this pack. They've included two Romero dead films, two genuine Romero zombie films. The third one is not a Romero film, even though it has the same title as a Romero zombie film. So it's a little bit of a cheat. You could maybe say that I should have looked at the box more, read, read it more, done my research more. I mean, that is clearly not a still from Day of the Dead, but I just presumed it was like artwork because if you look at that bit that's artwork from survival of the dead it's not like a still from the movie so i don't know anybody could have made the error but i was a little bit peeved off at the time and what it meant was that i had to then go out and buy another copy of day of the dead now this worked out in the long run because this is actually a really cool version of the film it's got like a, a commentary on it and quite a few features a documentary so i'm quite happy with this now and I wouldn't have bought this had this not turned out to be so irritating. But I certainly didn't feel like watching The Day of the Dead on here. Not for a long time anyway. And then I thought to myself, you know what, I might as well watch it, seen as I own it, for this mini-reviews thing, right? And I won't lie, part of me was hoping it would turn out to be the world's worst movie, just so I could hate on it, as would be what it deserves. But it's not bad. I mean, it's not great either. It's it's got none of the subtlety of the of, of the original film. This new one, it, the zombies don't just run in this one. It's almost like they're teleporting from one place to another. They are ridiculously fast. I think they've just filmed people running in this and then sped it up. It's it's just a bit silly. 
There is some good splatter and action, but it's literally non-stop. There's no subtlety to the film. You don't really get to properly know the characters. I sort of enjoyed it in a in a really laid back sort of, okay, there's zombie killed and explosions everywhere. I can I can at least see this through to the end, but it's it's not a film that I will put on again. And honestly, if you want to watch any version of Day of the Dead, go for this one. So for the two, for the 2006 one, 2008, whatever the hell year this newer one came out, I'll give it a respectable two and a half out of five, but it pales compared to the original film. This is today's hidden gem. It's an absolutely wonderful film. I saw it on Shudder. It's another one that fits into the zombie subgenre. So at the beginning of this, the zombie apocalypse has started and we pick up the action by following this rapper and his girlfriend as they're driving away from Vegas. I think they're heading for an airfield because this rapper's got quite a bit of money and so he's going to pay to have him and his girlfriend transported to some island or somewhere, somewhere way away from the, the carnage that's ongoing. But their car breaks down in the middle of the Nevada desert and they're in big trouble. And in the distance, they spot this one zombie coming towards them. Presumably it just came out of Vegas or whatever. Now, the zombie kills the guy quite quickly. And I'm not giving too much away because this is like the first 10 minutes of the film. The girlfriend panics, grabs like a bag of supplies off the back seat of the car, runs off into the desert. The zombie follows her into the desert. And this is now going to be the bulk of much of the movie. Just this one zombie chasing this woman across the desert. It sounds a very simplistic story, and it is. It sounds like something that might be better suited for a 25, 30 minute short as, as part of a horror anthology, but this film does a really great job of taking the story in unexpected directions. None of them feel artificial. Every twist and development that happens in this feels either very natural or very creative. I was really impressed by how the story just proceeded from one section of the film to the other. It is one of those slow-moving Romero-type zombies. If, if this was a fast-moving zombie, I don't think this woman would stand a chance. I mean, it's, it looked really hot in this desert. She can outrun the zombie, but the zombie doesn't need to sleep. She does. She needs to rest as well. So it's, it's a really interesting game of cat and mouse. This woman, she can't just fool the zombie and go in a different direction either because she has to stay on this same narrow direction that she's going in order to reach the airfield because she's sticking to that plan. She's got this phone with like a GPS system and she's following where she needs to go. I think it's like 20 miles between the car and the airfield. It, brilliant film this and I love the various different ways that the story goes in the last sort of 30-40 minutes. The woman um, is played by Brittany Snow, really good acting performance and I love the development of ca the character in this because right at the start she's like this gangster's girlfriend with too much makeup and jewellery and she, she seems a bit airheaded. Not impressed with her at that point, but throughout the film she really grows as a character. It turns out she's got this son somewhere else that she's not seen for quite some time and she keeps having flashbacks of this son and by the end of the movie th this woman had grown so much as a character. So fantastic film, four and a half out of five and it is absolutely my most hugely recommended uh, film of this video. This is another brilliant film. I saw it on Netflix. The story of how I came to watch it's quite funny. I, I was in one of those weird moods where you can't settle on what to watch and I was scrolling through film after film after film, couldn't make my mind up. I came across this film that had a still picture of a woman on a train with the title, No One Gets Out Alive. And I thought, ooh, horror film on a train where no one can get out alive. Yeah, I'm, I'm sold. Let's just watch this one. Turns out that that was the only scene in this film on a train. The rest of it is, is nothing to do with trains, but that's fine because the movie turned out to be absolutely terrific. So we've got this female character who moves into this apartment block. It's, it's a fairly small apartment block. It's got like 10 rooms to rent in it, and it's run by this man and his brother. But it turns out that they are dabbling in weird rituals. They they They've got this demon that they summon. They've got their reasons for summoning this demon that we, that we find out as the movie progresses. But what they're doing is not very healthy. And they're even sacrificing some of the women who rent rooms in this apartment block. So the woman that we follow moving into this place, she ends up in this really hellish situation. You've got a really good human threat in this film and the demon threat. We don't see the demon until very, very late in it, but it's it's fantastically designed. I mean, when, as soon as I saw it, I thought, wow, that's amazing. That was absolutely worth waiting all the way through the film to, to see that. 
But what also elevates this film is the main character and the emotional journey she goes on. She's this Mexican immigrant who has somehow ended in the ended up in the United States at like 21, 22 or whatever. But she doesn't have access to all the things that other Americans have because of the fact that she's not American. She's not, she's not strictly meant to be in the country, but you, you feel for her. She just wants to have a life. And she's got no money throughout this film. She, she can barely cobble together the, the dollars to get a room deposit down. She gets a job at this factory, but the, the working conditions are absolutely horrible. She just can't catch a break. This film really depicts what it's like for somebody to be on the bottom of the social ladder. And I'm sort of glad that a film would do that. Normally, in any movie, horror or otherwise, characters always have whatever money they need. You know, oh, need $500 to get on a ferry to escape the zombie apocalypse? Oh, go on then, it's my last 500 bucks, but needs must. But in this film, this character just never seems to have money for what she needs. And y your heart just goes out to her. It crossed my mind halfway through this film that given a choice between fixing the horror of her welfare and fixing the horror of all these supernatural things she's experiencing at the apartment where she lives, I reckon at least up to a point she would choose fixing the welfare situation and, and just take her chances with the horror. That's, that's how bad things are for her. But I'm so glad a film would have a character like this that depicts what people go through in real life, rather than just having the usual middle-class protagonist who lives somewhere like Haddonfield in an affluent family with a white picket fence and their biggest problem is whether they're going to get off with Amber at the prom, you know, that kind of thing. Or whether they're going to pass their midterm, because if they don't, they might end up having to spend their life working for their father's insurance company. Oh, no. But this film is absolutely fantastic. It's got so many things that work and... It, it was so good, actually, that towards the end, I was just praying that it wouldn't blow it in the last sort of 10, 20 minutes, but it didn't. And I'm relieved about that. I'm going to give this one four and a half out of five, which is the same score I gave to the previous film. But It Stains the Sands Red is still going to be my gem of the day, just because it's slightly more original than this one. But this one is still a terrific movie. Another Netflix film, because, you know, I really wanted to make the most of that subscription before I cancelled it, even though I didn't end up cancelling it. So this is basically a slasher film in the woods. It's literally half Friday the 13th, half wrong turn. So if you like those franchises, then you'll probably like this. Even Netflix describes this film on its little descriptive thing as like a Friday the 13th type film. And in terms of wrong turn, I mean, there is literally a scene in this which has been lifted directly from the original 2003 wrong turn. There's also a splattering of the burning in it, I'd say. But what I really love about this is the killer. Once you see who the killer is, the makeup and the design of the killer, the aesthetic, it's, it's fantastic. I was like, wow, what a great design that is for a killer. And after that point, I just wanted to see the killer on screen as much as possible because I just loved the makeup effects and what they've done. You know, if you're one of those people who constantly thinks about which Jason looks best because of all the different designs and the makeup and the which bits of bone and skin you can see and stuff like that, then you, you might really appreciate what they've done with the killer in this film. If you're someone who appreciates that kind of thing, uh, then, then you'll be right at home here. There are a few faults in this. I mean, we mostly follow these six or seven campers as they get terrorised in the woods, as you'd expect. But one of the characters is annoying as hell. It, it's, it's like a geek-type character, but it's just it, he's just not very well written. And by the end of the film, he's just really, really annoying. There's also this really bizarre moment where somebody seems to come back from the dead, even though they were clearly killed off earlier. And when they're brought back, they're brought back for like a minute just so they can get randomly killed by a hobo. It's just bizarre that they would come back. But apart from these one or two little things, this is a mostly enjoyable slasher film. I'm going to give it three and a half out of five. And it even has a sequel also on Netflix which I've not watched yet, but I'm going to make that one of my next films that I watch in the coming days. And I, I might include my review of that on my next mini reviews video. But as for this one, I'm, I'm going to draw things to a close. And I think this has probably been one of the higher quality uh, mini reviews videos I've done in terms of the scores that I've given. There are a number of really top quality films that I've included in, in, in this particular video. I'm, I'm really pleased, really pleased with some of the stuff I've watched recently. But I will leave it there. Until next time, 
Cheerio, bye-bye.